Tonight on KQED Newsroom, we speak with our top education official, Tony Thurmond, about the future of education in California. And we continue our technology series with a look at the safety of driverless cars. Plus, generative artificial intelligence has roared onto the scene. Is this truly a moment of historic change for humanity? Bloomberg's preeminent technology journalist, Emily Chang, joins us with her perspective. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, June 2nd, 2023. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Priya David Clemens. Please stay with us tonight for an important announcement about this program at the end of the show. But up first, Tony Thurman started his job as state superintendent of instruction in 2019 after representing parts of the East Bay in the state assembly. The state's public schools are dealing with unprecedented issues exacerbated by the pandemic. Staffing shortages, low literacy rates, absenteeism, and a mental health crisis among students. Joining me now is our state superintendent, Tony Thurmond. Tony, thank you for being with us. Thank you. So we will dig into these hard issues in a moment, but first, would you just share with me what drives your passion for education? Education is everything for me. I mean, it saved my life, you know, growing up uh, as a uh, son of immigrants and having lost my only parent to cancer when I was six years old, being raised by a cousin who I never met until I showed up on her doorstep. Um, I needed a lot of help and education opened doors for me. You know, I grew up on the free lunch program, food stamps and government cheese. I, I ate so much government cheese, I thought USDA was a brand name. <laughs> and these are the programs that helped my family overcome poverty. Public education is the most important program to help my family. It's opened doors for me, and it's an honor for me to be able to serve the six million students in our state to make sure they get a great and quality education. And food actually is a big part of that. Yes. It's not something that's top of mind when it comes to education, but you're working very hard to provide meals for students. Yeah, we have so many hungry kids and we don't need to. We have the resources that we can feed anyone. And now in California, we have a thing that we call universal meals. That just means any student can get two meals a day for free without paperwork, regardless of their background, their income or their neighborhood. You know, someone who relied on the free lunch program, it's uh, an honor to be able to provide universal meals to every student in our state. And that was a problem during the pandemic because students often weren't getting meals during uh, the school closures. Right. And then some of those programs had to open up and right. provide those meals, yeah. which is great that California was able to do that. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to the education piece of it because sure. we do have major learning loss from yes. the pandemic. Yes. Tell us where we stand right now. You know, I'd say the situation is hopeful, right? We are in a state where we are guaranteeing preschool for every three and four year old. Um, the universal meals that we just talked about. And we have the ability to make sure that our students will learn to read by the third grade. And we have the resources to support all these things. But that's coming against the backdrop of seeing an increase in depression for our students. And, and we have resources there. We have $4 billion in wraparound supports, counseling type programs to help them. But we've got to address the trauma that our students have gone through during the pandemic. We've got to help them bounce back and close learning gaps that grew during the pandemic. And we have resources for every school, more after school programs. Schools can have a longer school year or school day, more STEAM education. We have the resources to overcome these challenges and we will. I believe that uh, the state of education is hopeful, though we have a lot of work to go. And California is providing more resources than any other state to help our students get there. All right, well, let's put some meat on the bones okay. of some of those elements you just spoke about. In terms of mental health, Yes. a survey from the ACLU California Action and the CSU Center to close the opportunity gap found that roughly one-fifth of students felt they were traumatized or would not be the same because of the pandemic. More than 60% said they'd experienced an emotional breakdown. And then let's turn to this reading gap that you're yeah. talking about. California, yeah. you do have a goal that yes. every California student should be able to read by third grade. That's you're right. aiming for that for the 25-26 school year. Recent data shows that almost 60% of California's third graders are behind on that benchmark. Yeah. What are the actions you're taking to move us forward? You know, for all the schools that um, have the most struggling readers, we are providing them with reading coaches and specialists. As, as simple as it sounds, most people don't know how to teach reading. Uh, and there are certain um, tried and true practices and best practices that are necessary. 
when you are teaching reading to students from all backgrounds, including low-income students and English learners. And so um, having a reading coach and a specialist to help new teachers is, uh, is a critical opportunity. Reading is a gateway skill. When you learn to read, you can read to learn anything. And third grade is such a critical benchmark. And so we just want to remind parents, to read to your children. You know, the, the old campaign people talk about, talk, read, sing. All of that makes a difference from the time our children are born. We should be reading to them, singing to them, helping them to develop a love of reading. It will carry them throughout their life. And when you learn to read by third grade, you're less likely to drop out of school. Um, we can literally educate and not incarcerate our kids by ensuring they learn to read by third grade. And, and I just want to put out a resource for anyone who is experiencing depression. They can text or call 988. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a counselor can connect you to a program. This is the experience of our lifetime. The pandemic is the toughest thing that most of us will ever go through in our lifetime. And we've seen an increase in depression and anxiety and suicidal feelings. And we have the resources to help our students. We are in the midst of recruiting 10,000 more mental health clinicians to work in our schools. Matter of fact, we have a scholarship for anyone who wants to become a mental health clinician or a teacher uh, we'll provide you $20,000 uh, here in the state of California. When it comes to that learning loss and the gap, there also yes. seems to be a gap in what parents know about yes. their students' education. I want to point specifically to a billboard that went up in Sacramento, and it noted that 87% of Sacramento County parents think their students do math at grade level, but only 28% do. What is going on with this gap between parent knowledge and involvement and where students are at? And also only about 30% doing math at grade level? That seems very low. We can do better and we will do better. And the reality is, is that students have struggled in math and reading since before the pandemic, especially students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. We call that the achievement gap. I call it the opportunity gap because I believe that our students can achieve but we have to remove the barriers that our students face. We have 200,000 students in the state who are homeless, about 8,000 who live on their own, hungry students, students who are marginally um, homeless, who are experiencing health issues. These things get in the way of our student success, but we can do something about that. I want to shout out a program called the Calculus Roundtable. Uh, it is a program that focuses on STEAM education and math education. It breaks math down into ways that students find enjoyable, practical ways to learn and, and, and exciting. Um, we are also working to provide um, a, a class in this state called uh, personal finance, where students basically learn how the economy works. Um, and we have found that by providing personal finance, not only do we help our students have a lower amount of debt, but by providing this kind of financial literacy, you can teach algebra and other forms of mathematics in ways that students find practical and can help them be successful. We're on the path and we're gonna help our students make improvements in math and in every other subject. And in the last 30 seconds we have here, let's talk about the problem that we have with teachers. We do not have enough teachers. Yes. California has invested more than a billion dollars into teacher recruitment. Yes. What more needs to happen so that we can fill these vacancies? You know, a lot of folks don't know that this is an opportunity. And so we have a public service announcement campaign to let folks know about the values and the virtues of becoming a, a classroom educator. Um, we offer a scholarship, again, $20,000. Anyone is interested in that can just send us a note at teachinca at cde.ca.gov. And we'll call you back and connect you to a teacher credentialing program and how to get the scholarship. Um, this is a call to action. Um, and teachers are amongst our greatest champions um, delivering for our students in our state. And every state's having a shortage, but California's leading the way, and we're going to lead the way to make sure that we have great teachers and classified staff supporting our students. All right. Optimistic words from our California Superintendent of Public Ed Instruction, Tony Thurman. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Driverless cars are already moving along densely packed San Francisco streets. But let's hit the brakes for a second and try to understand what this means for human drivers and street safety and whether more regulations are necessary. We're joined now by Ellie Casson, head of city policy and government affairs for Waymo, and Professor William Riggs, director of USF's Autonomous Vehicles and the City Initiative. They both both joined by Skype. And Professor Riggs, you're in Barcelona right now at an autonomous vehicles conference. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Priya. 
We think of California, Professor Riggs, as being a leader in autonomous vehicles. Certainly much of the technology has been developed here. Can you give us an overview of the driverless car landscape right now here in California, but across the world? That's right. Well, we are the epicenter of innovation here in California, and this is just one of those areas where uh, the Bay Area particularly continues to lead in the development of sophisticated technology, and this is one that moves us through space. And the pleasure I have here talking in Barcelona at an international conference is to talk about all the great things we're doing from an innovation standpoint, but also a policy standpoint, and to compare notes with other deployments around the, the, the world, including both in Europe and in Asia, and to basically um, see if there are things that we can learn, but also to share some of the learnings that companies like Waymo and Cruise uh, and Zooks and the other innovative uh, organizations we have in California um, are, you know, have for the rest of society. Well, Ellie, you're joining us from Southern California, and thank you also for being part of the show today. You are on the tip of the spear, and Waymo has launched fleets of driverless cars in Phoenix and in San Francisco. In Phoenix, people can pay to hail one of your vehicles. Here in San Francisco, you have free rides available until you get final regulatory approval. Tell me about your goals for Waymo. Will it be a competitor to Lyft or Uber or to taxis? Uh Thank you, Priya. Yes, that's right. Uh, Waymo operates the world's largest 24-7 public ride hailing service that is fully autonomous in Phoenix. So if anyone is uh, lives or is visiting Phoenix, um, you can download the app and use it to, to get around a car with absolutely no one in it. We'll pick you up and take you to, to your destination. We are, as you said, operating a similar service in San Francisco. Um, uh, we've across the two markets are offering tens of thousands of rides every week. Um, and we're taking more and more people off the wait list and, and pulling them into our San Francisco service all the time. And, and as soon as we get that final permit from the CPUC, we'll, we'll be offering uh, paid rides uh, just as we are in Phoenix. So we're very excited about that. Okay, um, well, and yes, oh, we, we please. are uh, just gonna say that, yes, we um, are looking to add another option to um, people's mobility choices, um, and one that we think will will complement uh, the choices that are available today um, to, to supplement public uh, transit, supplement the taxi and other ride hailing options that are out there, um, so yeah. I do wanna dig into this regulatory piece because you are waiting on final approval here in San Francisco, and there have been several documented incidents of safety concerns. The local news outlet, Mission Local, obtained about 15 fire department incident reports documenting dangerous or nuisance situations where Waymo or cruise vehicles interfered with fire vehicles or emergency scenes. It, Waymo is asking for its self-driving vehicles to be allowed to operate day or night across basically the entirety of San Francisco. It speeds up to 65 miles per hour. But city officials aren't convinced. They filed a letter saying robo-taxis, as they call them, are not safer than human drivers. And they said, quote, that Waymo driverless AVs, autonomous vehicles, have committed numerous violations that would preclude any teenager from getting a California driver's license. These are very significant words, strong words, against the project that you're trying to launch here. Tell me how Waymo is addressing these safety concerns. Sure, thank you. Well, um, yes, I think it's important to note a couple of things. One is that uh, we welcome the, the public input that's part of the, the permitting process that we're going through. It's one of the things that makes California's regulatory process robust. And um, I think one of the reasons that Billy is in the EU sharing our, our learnings and experience uh, in California. Um, so uh, I think that's a, a good healthy part of the, the process. Um, it's also worth noting that um, there were about 20 letters of support from organizations that represent the groups that are currently unable to access transportation in the same way that a person who has a license uh, and is able to use a, a personal vehicle perhaps uh, it would, would benefit from our technology. So those um, in the disability community, for example, those in the sustainability community that recognize the tremendous value that an all electric fleet like the one that we offer will bring to, to California. Um, Additionally, I think uh, it's uh, something I want to call out is that 
uh, the, the letter from SFMTA had a lot of great points, but also some some uh, in, inaccurate information that we're looking forward to, to talking to them about in the in the coming weeks. And I think it's really important to focus not just on the anecdotal situations, which are important, and I, uh, I'm happy to talk about some of those uh, specific situations that you referenced, but also to look at the data and to remember that today in San Francisco and in America or across the world, 94% of crashes that happen on the road are the result of human error. And I, I have a feeling that everybody that's listening can think of someone in their life that's been impacted by a crash, perhaps a, fa a fatal crash. And the, the whole mission behind what we are pursuing is eliminating that human caused error in driving. And so I, I respect and appreciate the input that we've gotten from cities like uh, San Francisco from, from SFMTA, but I really think it's important for us to remember that the status quo of driving today is not as safe as it should be, and that we should not stand in the way of moving towards a safer roadway future because of some of these isolated anecdotal incidents, which we recognize there is room for improvement. We are always striving to get better and to take the learnings from one vehicle and apply them across our fleet so that we can improve all the time. And Professor Riggs, what do you say about these concerns about safety? What does your research tell you? Well, I think what the data is really telling us is that per million miles on the road, these platforms can drive safer than a human driver. And I think we should put into context that there's some politicization, you know, and sensual, you know, there's some media sensualizing this right now. Um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we are a city in San Francisco of experimentation. We've always been on the forefront of innovation. And that doesn't mean when we roll out new products, they're always perfect. But what we are doing is we're changing the narrative on who has a right to travel through a city. And if we are fully honest with ourselves, SFMTA doesn't give everyone in our city a right or full access to travel. There are certain parts of San Francisco where it's still hard to get a ride in the middle of the night. And what we're seeing from some of the deployments that we're doing and, and we've been studying this for over two years. We've had we've had thousands of students, for example, taking rides in some of the cruise vehicles. And what we're seeing is a real, I will use the word supplemental. And I'll say we're seeing complementary trends uh, with regard to automated vehicles really complementing public transport systems. And, and that is really the future that we're looking for is this, this future where mobility and access to jobs and housing Mobility is like running water. And I think if we use that as the benchmark, we should say yes to this transportation. We should say yes to public transportation. We said yes to scooters and bikes and pedestrians at the same time. So um, this is not ignoring some of the instances that we've seen in terms of first responders, but it's acknowledging that these are issues that we can work with companies uh, to solve, and, but they are corner case issues. They're exceptions to what is uh, not the norm of, of really safe driving. All right, well, Professor Billy Riggs from USF, thank you so much for joining us. Ellie Casson from Waymo, thank you for your insight and analysis. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Priya. This week, US and EU officials discussed restrictions on artificial intelligence during a trade meeting in Sweden. Next week, President Biden and UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also have AI concerns on their agenda as they meet in Washington. Generative artificial intelligence has been buzzed about as a paradigm shift for humanity, a change that will impact our work, our relationships, and our knowledge. Is this true? Is this hype? For a reality check, we asked Bloomberg's Emily Chang to join us. Emily is host and executive producer of The Circuit and author of Brotopia. Emily, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So what do you make of this new technology with all of your years of experience of covering Silicon Valley? So look, I think there is some hype. But there's also a new reality. This is incredibly powerful technology that's gonna change the way we work, the way we live, the way we love. How many jobs is it gonna create? How many jobs is it gonna destroy? We don't know that. We don't know how this all adds up. 
but it is going to be a big change. I think where the hype comes in is you've got a ton of investors pouring money into these new tech AI companies, and they have fear of missing out. Not all of these companies are going to succeed, and that is the stuff of bubbles, right? The overestimating of any kind of technology, new technology platform. It's definitely a topic that I'm investigating very deeply on my new show, and I'm also going to be interviewing Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, at the Bloomberg Technology Summit coming up later this month. So if you're interested, you can follow along. Well, and Sam Altman is one of 400 plus people who have signed a very short letter that went out this week. It said, 22 words, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. We are talking about an existential threat here with this technology. I, I mean, you have the leaders of these companies talking about the possibility of human extinction. And that is scary. I think it's really significant that it's not just the leaders of these companies, but some leading AI research institutes who signed that letter. That said, the letter is a little vague. I think it's only a 22 word statement. And, you know, you have to think about the fact that right now, this is algorithms. It's putting one word in front of the other. This isn't magic. The important thing to note is that the technology gets better as we use it. So in a way, the clock is ticking, which is why we need regulation yesterday. We need multiple stakeholders at the table, not just people like Sam Altman, because the reality is none of these companies are saying, oh, we're going to pause and stop building AI right now. They're all trying to build AI faster than the competition. Oh. So we need multiple parties at the table trying to figure out where the guardrail should be. And you are coming out with a brand new show. Quickly, if you can tell people how they can catch that. Yeah. The circuit. Bloomberg Television. You can also download the Bloomberg app on your phone or your smart TV. There's going to be a companion podcast as well. And we're interviewing people like the folks who work at OpenAI, uh, the co-founders of Twitter, you know, the most followed person on TikTok, Charlie D'Amelio, the CEO of Airbnb, the CEO of Microsoft. And this was really an opportunity for me to, to, to dig deeper. Topics like AI are really nuanced. It's complicated. I wanted to spend more time with these people who are building technologies and making decisions that are in, going to impact the lives of billions and, and billions of people. That launches June 9th. Excited for that. June thank 8th. June, June 8th. 8th. All right, Emily Chang, thank you so much. Thank you. Since 1985, a dog park in Richmond has been a haven for people who want to let their pups enjoy nature off leash. The park is situated on the shoreline and it encompasses roughly 50 acres of land. Point Isabel Dog Park is this week's look at something beautiful. I might have to check that out with my dog, Hamilton, this weekend. But now, to that important message I mentioned at the beginning of tonight's show. It is with a heavy heart that I share this news. Our program will be coming to an end this month. Here is KQED's president and CEO, Michael Lissip, with more. Hello, I'm Michael Lissip, president and CEO of KQED. After more than five decades, from the pioneering nightly news program, Newspaper of the Year in the late 60s, to the 90s in the weekly series This Week in Northern California, hosted by Bay Area icon Belva Davis until 2012. We now have the Me Too movement. Then the KQED newsroom with Tui Vu. Let's expand on that. because now Priya David Clemens, who's carried the host baton since 2020. KQED newsroom's last episode will be on June 23rd.
So there will be no increase in taxes. We this series, in all its forms, has been a source for in-depth, substantive interviews with regional, state, and national newsmakers well, and journalists. We've been with you for some of the most important Bay Area moments, from the free speech movement in the 60s Shock. to the assassinations of Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone in the 70s. This is how the latest data shows that only... Keeping you informed and safe through the pandemic and wildfires and prepared as you cast your vote during elections. We honor the historical significance of KQED Newsroom, and we will maintain our commitment to providing local and national news, information, and conversation. Whether on KQED Public Radio, KQED.org, or on our social media channels, KQED will continue to be a place for trusted, independent, and quality programming. Thank you. We will be honoring the legacy of this show with two special episodes. They'll run on June 16th and June 23rd. We will not have a show next week. I want to say a special thank you to all of you who have supported this program and our production team over the years. Thank you also for all the thoughtful messages you've sent to me. If you'd like to reach out, let me share how you can do that, as we do at the end of every show. You can email us at knr at kqed.org. You can also find KQED Newsroom online or on Twitter. And you can reach me on LinkedIn at Priya David Clemens. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend, and we will see you back here in two weeks for part one of our series finale on June 16th.